Hello. In this lecture, we'll look at graphs of trigonometric functions. For the sine and cosine function, we'll investigate domain, range, periodic properties, and where their roots are. For sinusoidal functions in general, we'll look at their equations, what the graphs look like, including terminology such as midline, amplitude, and period. Then we'll introduce graphing the tangent function, looking at its domain and range, its period, its roots, and how to visualize its picture. We're only looking at graphs of sine, cosine, and tangent. The other standard trigonometric functions, secant, cosecant, and cotangent, might be addressed separately, although we are not going to take much of a look at them. So in this lecture, all angles given are assumed to be in radians. Uh, the graphs of these functions are much easier to approach in radians, and as mentioned before, when doing calculus on trigonometric functions, you want to be working in radians and not degrees. So from this point forward, angles are in radians. We want to look at trigonometric functions, particularly sine and cosine, as functions. So we're going to be looking at their domain, what can you plug in, the range, what values do you get out, the zeros are roots, in other words, what values would you plug into the function will you get out a zero, and other properties. In doing so, we're going to be interpreting variables slightly differently than we have been for these functions. So we're not specifically going to be using x and y as coordinates of points on the unit circle. Rather, when we say something like f of x equals sine x or f of x equals negative 2 times the cosine of 3x, x is the input variable. This is our angle measured in radians, whereas y or f of x is the corresponding value of the function. So for f of x equals sine x, for example, y corresponds to the vertical coordinate of a point on the unit circle. But for f of x equals negative 2 times the cosine of 3x, you're fundamentally working with the horizontal coordinate of a point on the unit circle, even if you're graphing it as y equals f of x. Let's take a look at the domain of these functions. Now, any real number x could be treated as an angle. If you pick any number, you could just imagine this represents an angle in radians. Remember that radians are dimensionless or unitless. It's just a number. So you can always evaluate the sine or cosine of any real number x. That is to say, both sine and cosine, their domain is all real numbers. You can take the sine or cosine of any real number. What about the range? Well, when you evaluate sine or cosine, the output of this function corresponds to the horizontal or vertical coordinate of a point on the unit circle. Now, points on the unit circle, their coordinates were between plus or minus 1. Therefore, the sine function and the cosine function are always between plus and minus 1. So in conclusion, the range of both sine and cosine is the interval from minus 1 to 1, and it includes both endpoints. As your angle rotates around, the corresponding point on the unit circle will have vertical and horizontal coordinates going all the way from minus 1 to positive 1. Now the angles x and x plus 2 pi are coterminal. So if you were to put both of these angles into a circle, they would correspond to the same point. That is to say, the vertical and horizontal coordinates of the point they correspond to would be the same because they correspond to the same point. So the values of sine x and cos x repeat themselves every time you add a multiple of 2 pi to the input variable, because this represents simply going around the circle one more time, but still looking at the same point. So for any integer k, the sine of x plus 2 pi times k is equal to the sine of x, because all you've done is taken the angle x and gone around the circle a certain number of times, k. And similarly, the cosine of x plus 2k times pi will be equal to the cosine of x. We have a term for this in mathematics. We say that sine x and cos x are periodic functions whose period is 2 pi. In general, when we refer to a function as periodic, we're saying that the values repeat themselves after a certain amount of time. And that smallest number p, which when added to the input variable means you always get the same thing out, that's called the period. Now the zeros of sine and cosine come from points on the unit circle where one of the coordinates is zero. So here's the unit circle with intersections with the horizontal line y equals zero and the vertical line x equals zero marked. So at these points, the vertical coordinate is zero, so the sine function assigns a zero to these corresponding inputs. Whereas at these points, the horizontal coordinate of the point on the circle is zero, so cosine assigns a zero to these inputs. What are the inputs that correspond to these points? 
So here is a smaller diagram from the previous slide. We want to know what are the angles that correspond to these marked points. Well, sine x is zero when x is zero. Now this is not corresponding to an x coordinate, but rather an angle. If this is your initial side, the positive x-axis, we're in standard orientation and position, and you go an angle of zero, you are still pointing in this direction. So the angle of zero corresponds to this point. The vertical coordinate is zero. So if the angle x is zero, the vertical coordinate of that point is zero. Here it is. But also pi, that points straight left. 2 pi, if we simply go all the way around and point right again. 3 pi, we go all the way around and then another half rotation to point left, and so forth. But we could also rotate in the clockwise direction, and this would make negative angles. So the angle of minus pi would be to rotate clockwise half a rotation, but you're still pointing left. The angle of negative 2 pi would be to go clockwise all the way around the circle, and you'd be pointing right, and so forth. So all of these are numbers integer times pi, zero, plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus three, all times pi. For cosine, when is the cosine of an angle zero? Well, we want the angle to correspond to these points. Okay, so what angle points straight up? That would be pi over two, an initial side here, and then pi over two angle will point straight up. Three pi over two adds one additional pi onto this and therefore points straight down. 5 pi over 2 is coterminal with pi over 2. It's simply pi over 2 plus 2 pi. 7 pi over 2 is coterminal to 3 pi over 2, and so forth. But again, we could rotate clockwise. So if I go clockwise pi over 2, starting from our pointing right angle of 0, pi over 2 is 1 quadrant. So if I go clockwise 1 quadrant, I would be pointing down, and I have a horizontal component of 0. So the cosine of minus pi over 2 is also 0. And again, similarly, you can do minus 3 pi over 2, minus 5 pi over 2. You're simply getting angles that are coterminal to the angles that point at the blue marked points. So therefore, the zeros of the cosine function are odd multiples of pi over 2. We write this typically as 2k plus 1 times pi over 2, where k is an integer. 2k plus 1 for k being an integer, that's the generic form for an odd number. If k is 0, this becomes 1. If k is 1, this becomes 3. If k is 2, this becomes 5, and so forth. You can incidentally think of the zeros of the sine function as all even multiples of pi over 2. Now you would simplify your even number being 2k instead of 2k plus 1 times pi over 2. You'd cancel your 2s and just have k times pi, which is why it's written like that here. It's usually simplified in that form. But it may be helpful to think that zeros of cosine are odd multiples of pi over 2, whereas zeros of sine are even multiples of pi over 2. So let's let f of x equal sine x. We want to look at a graph of this function. So let's make a table of some specific values. We're going to choose some angles, some x values, between 0 and 2 pi, for which we know the value of the sine function. Specifically, pi over 4, pi over 2, 3 pi over 4. There are other angles that we know the value of the sine function exactly, but we're just looking at pi over 4 multiples. Okay, the sine of 0 is 0. However, the sine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. The sine of pi over 2 is 1, and so forth. All of these examples are established in earlier videos. So now let's plot these points. We have x's, which represent angles, and now we have y equals f of x, which represents the sine of that angle. So our x-coordinates are marked off at pi over 4 and multiples thereof, and our y-values are marked off at what we saw, 0, plus or minus root 2 over 2, and plus or minus 1. So when x is 0, the sine function takes a 0. When x is pi over 2, the sine function is equal to root 2 over 2. When x is pi over 2, the sine function is 1. And if we keep working through the chart of values that we've already established, we just start filling in these points like this. Now we can sort of draw a best fit curve, and it would look something like that. So here is our first attempt at a graph of f of x equals sine x based on the table of values that we constructed. But remember, we earlier stated that sine x is a periodic function whose period is 2 pi. So if you add 2 pi to the input angle, the value of the sine function repeats itself. 
So after x equals 2 pi, we've already plotted the curve from 0 to 2 pi. After 2 pi would just be like adding 2 pi to a number that we've already investigated. So the values start repeating themselves. So here was the picture from 0 to 2 pi. Now if I keep moving beyond 2 pi, I'm simply going to be repeating the values starting at 0. So from 2 pi to 4 pi, we will get the same picture we got from 0 to 2 pi. You can do the same thing extending the graph to the left as well. So here is a picture of the sine curve from 0 to 2 pi. It's a little compressed because we've uh, tried to fit more into the graph. From 2 pi to 4 pi, it repeats the same shape, but from negative 2 pi to 0 and from negative 4 pi to negative 2 pi, it repeats the same shape again. So it just repeats this picture over and over again, going up and down, up and down, oscillating back and forth. Imagine in your head a point rotating around a circle and you're looking at the height of the point on the circle as your angle goes around. Your angle goes up, comes down, goes up, comes down, goes up, comes down, repeating forever. Now functions that have graphs that look like this are sometimes called wave functions, but more specifically sinusoidal functions. Now since the graph of sine x made this repeating wave shape, it should come as no surprise that cos x looks very similar. Here's a table of values, again for x being multiples of pi over 4, we're going to look at the cosine of these angles. The cosine of 0 is 1, then cosine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2, and so forth. Again, all of these values established already. Now if we plot these points out, here's what we would get. When x is 0, we start at a height of 1, and then we go down until for x equals pi, we have a height of minus 1, and then back up. Drawing in the curve, it would look something like this. Now cosine is also periodic with period 2 pi. So the graph will obey a similar sort of cut and paste appearance. Here was the graph between 0 and 2 pi. So between 2 pi and 4 pi, we simply take the same shape and slide it over but we can also move to the left over and over and over again. So observe, we basically get the same shape. It's slightly different in that it starts at a different height, but the overall up, down, up, down shape is the same. Now our goal from here is to develop some vocabulary and principles that we can use to describe such functions, these sinusoidal wave functions in general. Now given a periodic function, a cycle, is a portion of the graph that comprises one full period. So for sine x, we determined that this is a cycle. This was the bit that we repeated over and over again, whereas for cosine x, this was the picture that we got that repeated over and over. So the full graph of a periodic function is just graph one cycle and then repeat it. Now the values of a periodic function will therefore oscillate between the highest value and the lowest value, possibly achieving them multiple times per cycle, but still there will be a maximum and a minimum and we'll go back and forth between them. So here, for example, is some periodic function. It goes down to a minimum, up to a maximum, does some stuff, minimum, maximum, does some stuff, but it looks like the period is roughly from here to here and then that picture simply repeats over and over again. So we have these maximums and these minimums, and we just have a shape that goes back and forth. Now, if we take the horizontal line or the y value exactly halfway between the maximum and the minimum, this is called the midline of the function. This is roughly what we would get for this function here, halfway between the max and the min. This can be computed as the average of the max and min values. So you take the maximum, add to it the minimum, and divide the resulting sum by two to compute the average. Amplitude is another term we use to describe these graphs, and it represents the height of a periodic function either above or below its midline, the distance from the midline to either the max or the min. This can be computed as the maximum minus the minimum value over two. Maximum minus minimum would compute the height difference between these two points, divide it by two, and you get exactly half. So the amplitude is this distance from max to midline or from midline to minimum. Now both sine x and cosine x have midline y equals 0 and amplitude 1. Both of them had a maximum of 1 and a minimum of minus 1. So if the maximum is 1 and the minimum is minus 1, you would quickly see that the midline is 0. And if the maximum is 1 and the minimum is minus 1, this amplitude would in contrast be 1. Now the maximum and minimum values of cosine happen for different angles. 
but the maximum is 1 for both functions and the minimum was minus 1. Let's look at an example. Let's try to graph one full cycle of the function y equals minus 3 times the sine of x. We will find its midline and its amplitude. So multiplying sine x, which is a graph we've already seen, by negative 3 reflects the graph over the x-axis because we're multiplying by a negative number and stretches it vertically by a factor of 3. So here was our graph of sine x, one complete cycle. We flip it across the x-axis because we have multiplied everything by minus 1, and then we stretch it vertically by a factor of 3. So now we can ask, what are the midline and amplitude? Well, referring to the graph, we have a maximum height of 3 and a minimum height of minus 3. These come from the minimum and maximum of the original function. Multiplying by negative 1 takes what was a maximum, turns it into a minimum, and vice versa. So from a max of 1, we now get a min of minus 1. From a min of minus 1, a max of 1. And then we multiply everything by 3. So with a maximum of 3 and a minimum of minus 3, we add and divide by 2 to get a midline of 0, and to take a difference and divide by 2 to get an amplitude of 3. Now any function of the form, a constant times the sine of kx plus a constant, or a constant times the cosine of kx plus a constant, are called sinusoidal functions. These constants a, k, and c respectively affect the amplitude, period, and midline of the function. In other sources, you may see different letters representing these things. We are using a, k, and c. The amplitude of the sinusoidal function is the absolute value of a. As written above, don't assume that a is a positive number just because you do not see a minus sign in front of it. a is just some constant, possibly negative, so the amplitude is the absolute value of a. The period of the sinusoidal function may be computed as 2 pi divided by the absolute value of k. And the midline of the function is simply y equals c. The graph of a sinusoidal function will be a wave-like thing that we've seen before. The amplitude tells you the height of the wave above and below the midline, and the period tells you the length of one cycle of the graph. In other words, how long it takes the graph to start repeating itself. So for example, suppose f of x is 4 times the cosine of 2x plus 1.5. We'll find the amplitude, period, and midline, and then we will graph the function on the interval 0 to 2 pi. So here we identify a is 4, it's the number multiplying the sine or cosine. k is 2, it's the number multiplying the variable x inside the sine or cosine function. And the constant being added at the end, c, is 1.5. So we identify the amplitude is 4, the absolute value of a. The period is 2 pi over k, or 2 pi over 2, which is simply pi. And the midline is just y equals 1.5. That's typically the easiest one to read off. So for the graph, we're going to plot the axes and the midline. Here are our axes, and here is our midline of y equals 1.5. Notice on the x-axis, we have specifically gone from 0 to 2 pi, because that was the interval on which we were asked to graph this function. Now the period of f of x is pi, and the amplitude is 4. So on the interval from 0 to pi, there will be one full cycle of a cosine curve, starting at 4 units above the midline and ultimately getting to 4 units below it. So starting from 4 units above 1.5, and then pi steps later coming back to the same point, because that is the period of this function is pi, and halfway between reaching a minimum of 4 units below the midline of 1.5, we have this cosine shape going from its maximum down to its minimum and back up over the full period of pi. But because we were asked to graph this on the interval from 0 to 2 pi, we just get the same picture again. So here is our graph of f of x equals 4 times the cosine of 2x plus 1.5. Let's work backwards. Here is the picture of a sinusoidal curve. Let's try to figure out a possible equation for the graph below. So we are looking at the graph of a sinusoidal function. It has this familiar shape. So it's some number times either sine or cosine of some kx plus something else. We've got to determine the values of a, k, and c, and also whether we want to use a sine or cosine. So the value of c comes from the midline. The value of a comes from the amplitude. The value of k comes from how long one period is. 
And whether the curve is going to be chosen to be a sine or a cosine, or possibly a negative sine or negative cosine, is something we have to determine, which we'll get to later. Specifically, we're going to look at what the graph looks like near the y-axis, near the equation x equals zero. But again, we'll see that in just a minute. So here is the graph of our function, and we want to figure out what the function is. To find the midline, you want to find the max value and the min value and take their average. So let's look at this graph and try to find how high it gets and how low. The midline is going to be given by y equals this value. So we find we have a maximum here, which appears to be at y equals 1, and the minimum seems to correspond to y equals negative 3. So the midline is the average of these two numbers, which works out to be minus 1. So this tells us that c equals minus 1 in our sinusoidal function. What about the amplitude? The amplitude is computed as the maximum minus the minimum over 2. So again, we have a maximum of 1 and a minimum of minus 3. If we compute maximum minus minimum over 2, we end up with a value of 2. So the amplitude is 2. Now to find the period, <clears throat> we have two possible options. One way to do this is to find the distance between three consecutive points on the midline. So if this is our sinusoidal curve, if you find three consecutive midline points, that represents one full cycle. And this is like finding one cycle of a sine curve. Remember, this is what the sine curve looked like. I would point out, if you found this point to this one to this one, it would start off by going down, and it would look like a negative sine curve, a sine curve reflected across the x-axis. But having found three consecutive midline points, the period will simply be b minus a. The other option is to simply go from one maximum to the next, and this is like finding a cycle of a cosine curve. You could also go from one minimum to the next, it's functionally the same. So if you label the values corresponding to two consecutive maxima as c and d, the period will simply be d minus c. Now this second option is usually a little easier because you only have to find two consecutive points rather than three, but it's not a big deal to use one or the other as long as you can accurately pull points off of your graph. So here was the example we were looking at. To find the period, we're going to look for two consecutive peaks. There were other options, this just happens to be what we're going with. So there happens to be a peak here at x equals minus pi over three and another one here at x equals pi, and that's the next one. It's important not just to find two maximum value, but two consecutive maxima. So the period will be the distance between these two x values, pi minus minus pi over three, which is four pi over three. So there's our period. From the period, we can compute the value of this uh, scalar multiple k inside the sine or cosine function. Remember, the period is computed as 2 pi over k, which you can solve for k to be 2 pi over the period. So here the period was 4 pi over 3. That allows us to compute that k is 2 pi over 4 pi over 3, which simplifies down ultimately to just 3 over 2. So we're going to let k equal 3 over 2. Now what we have to do is to decide whether we have a sine, a cosine, or a minus sine or minus cosine. The sine curve fundamentally looks like this. At the axis, it is increasing and crosses the x-axis. At the y-axis, the negative sine curve is decreasing as it crosses. The cosine curve, however, at the y-axis is having its maximum value, whereas negative cosine is having its minimum. So these two graphs, the red ones on the left, we've seen. To get the ones on the right, you're simply doing a reflection across the x-axis because you're multiplying by minus 1. So where this was going up and having a root, this will be going down and having a root. Where this is having its highest point, this will be having its lowest. So whatever your graph looks like, if you look near the y-axis, if it appears to be at its midline value but increasing, use sine. If it's at its midline value and decreasing, use negative sine. If it's at its maximum, use cosine. If it's at its minimum, use minus cosine. There are other possibilities that at the axis you might just be somewhere else other than a maximum, minimum, or midline value. This is something known as a phase shift, which we are postponing and we will get to later. For now, we can handle the case 
where our graph is either at a maximum, midline, or minimum value when it crosses the y-axis. So here was our graph. At the y-axis, we want to look at what's going on. But what have we established so far? We're either looking for a times sine or cosine of kx plus c. The midline was c equals minus 1. The amplitude is 2. And the period is 4 pi over 3, from which we computed that k is 3 over 2. The curve at the y-axis is at its midline value and decreasing. That means we're going to use a negative sine curve. So we're going to let our graph be given by f of x equals negative 2, the negative coming from the fact that we have our negative sine curve, negative 2 times the sine of kx, 3 over 2x, plus c, which was minus 1. So negative 2 sine of 3 halves x minus 1. Let's look at another example. So to find a function that might produce this graph, we need to find midline and amplitude. So we need to identify maximum and minimum values. The maximum appears to be 5, the minimum minus 5. So the midline is the average of those, which is 0. And the amplitude is 1 half the difference of the two, which works out to be 5. So we set c equals 0 and a equals 5. For the period, we need to find either the x-coordinates of two consecutive maxima, two consecutive minima, or three consecutive midline values. We're going to look at a maximum at x equals 0 and x equals 8. So this point here at x equals 0 and this point here at x equals 8. The distance between those two consecutive peaks is exactly 8. So 2 pi over k is equal to 8, meaning k is 2 pi over the period, 2 pi over 8, or pi over 4. Now let's look at our curve shape. At the y-axis, are we at our maximum? Are we at a midline value increasing, midline value decreasing, or are we at our minimum? We are at our maximum value at the y-axis, so we're going to use a positive cosine. So we go ahead and set g of x to be positive 5 times the cosine of pi over 4x plus 0, since c was 0. Now let's take a look at the tangent function. Having in investigated the graphs of sine and cosine, maybe we can figure some stuff out about tangent. So remember that tan x is sine x over cos x. Therefore, the tangent function will be undefined when cosine of x equals 0. Can't divide by 0. When is cosine x equal to 0? At odd multiples of pi over 2. So consequently, the domain of the tangent function is all real numbers except when cosine is 0. In other words, all numbers except odd multiples of pi over 2. The range of the tangent function, in contrast, is actually all real numbers. Remember that sine and cosine are individually trapped between plus or minus 1. But if you are dividing by cosine, and cosine is very small, some number divided by a very small number could be very, very large. Also, the tangent function produces a zero whenever its numerator sine is zero. We've already established that the sine function has its roots at multiples of pi. Tan x is also periodic, but not with period 2 pi. It's actually periodic with period pi. So why is it period pi and not 2 pi like sine and cosine. So consider an angle theta that corresponds to some point on the unit circle AB. It doesn't really matter what quadrant you're in, but here's a picture. Now if we add pi to this angle, we're actually reflecting it over here. So from quadrant 1, we're now in quadrant 3. Had we started in quadrant 2, we would now be in quadrant 4 and so forth. Now what does this reflection do? It multiplies both coordinates of this point by minus 1. So had we been at a, b, we are now at negative a, negative b. And the tangent function is just the ratio between the two. So the tangent of this blue new angle is minus b over minus a, which is the same thing as b over a, which was the tangent of our angle. So the tangent function actually works out to have period pi, one half as long as the period of sine and cosine individually. So let's take a look at the graph of tangent. We've established that it has vertical asymptotes whenever x is an odd multiple of pi over 2. When x is an odd multiple of pi over 2, sine x is not 0, but cosine is. And something not 0 divided by something 0 generally leads you to a vertical asymptote. So here, at plus or minus pi over 2 and plus or minus 3 pi over 2, we're going to draw dashed lines to represent vertical asymptotes. In between the asymptotes, 
If you approach from the right, you go to minus infinity. But if you approach from the left, you go to positive infinity. We also have zeros at these multiples of pi. So ultimately, we end up with a picture like this. The picture from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 is generally considered the standard uh, single bit that you're going to copy and paste. Trying to determine whether you go up on one side or down on the other, you can figure it out based on what quadrant you are in. We know that there are vertical asymptotes at odd multiples of pi over 2 because you would be attempting to divide by cos x, which is 0. But from 0 to pi over 2, as an angle, that's the first quadrant, meaning tangent is positive. So in the first quadrant, from 0 to pi over 2, tangent is positive, but I have an asymptote, so I have to go up. Similarly, in the fourth quadrant, tangent is negative, so I would have to go down here. Now let's take an example. Suppose f of x is negative 2 times the tangent of pi over 2x. Let's find its domain. Let's sketch its graph as uh, x goes from minus 3 to positive 3. So the first thing we'll do is look at domain. Our generic tan x function, remember, was undefined when you are plugging in an odd multiple of pi over 2. So our function, we're not just plugging in x, we're plugging in pi over 2 times x. That is what is being input to the tangent function. So the thing we are inputting to the tangent function, pi over 2 times x, will not be allowed to take the value of an odd multiple times pi over 2. So solving this for x will tell us what values of x are not in the domain. The pi over 2s cancel, so x cannot be 2k plus 1 for an integer k. In other words, the domain of our function is all numbers except odd integers, those of the form 2k plus 1. So we're looking at a function that will have vertical asymptotes at the odd integers. Okay, so we've found the domain of our function to be all numbers except the odd integers. Now what about part b? Can we sketch the graph? It will have vertical asymptotes at the odd integers. Negative 3 and positive 3 are the endpoints of where we're supposed to look, but we also need to include plus or minus 1. So here are dashed lines for our vertical asymptotes. In between, we're going to draw our generic tangent shape, but look that it's been multiplied by negative 2. So it's actually been reflected, so instead of going up as we go from left to right, it will go down. And it's also been stretched vertically by a factor of 2, but with no uh, corresponding marks on our y-axis, that's not something we can easily represent. But here we have the generic tangent shape, but reflected across the x-axis to go down from left to right due to the fact that it was being multiplied by a negative number.